Um, thank you very much. Uh, tonight I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is international best practice on bus rapid transit and hopefully in the context of what might make sense for Boston. And I want to talk a little bit about station design because the station is really what gives bus rapid transit its functionality but also its personality. And it's the space that architects have entered into the bus rapid transit system development. Uh, Boston and Massachusetts is thinking about uh, bus rapid transit. Your governor uh, visited the, uh, the Metro bus BRT system in Mexico City. He was very impressed with it. Uh, he's given uh, MassDOT uh, some political space to develop the possibility of some really great quality BRT here in Boston. And the Bar Foundation's got a group of us working together to see what might make some sense. Um, but wait, you might say, don't we already have bus rapid transit here in Boston? Uh, there is the Silver Line, uh, isn't that BRT? Well, in some ways it has some elements of BRT, but uh, does it have all the elements? So ITDP uh, developed something called the BRT standard, which is a sort of uh, uh, quality guarantee, sort of like if, is, is it organic? You know, if food, you don't know, without the organic label, you really wouldn't be sure. Well. This is the label that you know whether it's really BRT or not. Uh, and BRT, uh, you need this kind of labeling because uh, in Boston, as in many cities across the country, the public was told, oh, this is BRT, it's gonna be really great. And then it turns out to be kind of not that great. And so, uh, you know, bus not so rapid transit has sort of proliferated uh, around the country uh, and uh, given bus rapid transit a bad name in some communities. Uh, this has uh, been told in New York City that this is bus rapid transit and you'll notice there's vehicles parked in the curb lane, it doesn't have any physical separation, uh, et cetera. You know, the public doesn't even know that this is a thing. Um, this is a thing, this is Curitiba, Brazil's BRT. It has dedicated lanes in the central part of the road. Uh, this is a very clear example from Quito of what that looks like. It's in the middle of the road, physical barriers to keep the traffic out of it. Uh, this is a system we designed in Ahmedabad, India, along the same lines. Uh, there are four systems in the U.S. that have this kind of alignment, Cleveland, Las Vegas, uh, Los Angeles, and Eugene, Oregon. Uh, bus rapid transit almost always has off-board fare collection because most of the delay is when people are getting on board and paying the driver. That's why buses go slow. So you have to have off-board fare collection. It means you pay to go through a turnstile or an inspector comes and checks your ticket. So this is Jakarta has this. Uh, in the United States, New York City, Los Angeles, Eugene, Cleveland, and the tunnel part of the Boston Silver Line to the airport, they have off-board fare collection. Uh, they are all using, uh, most of the U.S. systems use proof of payment, which means an inspector comes and checks. But that allows you to enter the bus from any of the doors, and that reduces a lot of your delay. Uh, the, the, the bus floor should be level with the boarding and alighting platform, or you have this problem. Uh, you know, if you're an elderly person or you've got a, a, a cart of groceries with you, you have to step up or down. This causes a big delay. This is, you know, three or four seconds while this woman gets on and off. It's blocked up the whole thing and slows everybody down. Uh, so all the great BRT systems have what we call at-level boarding. This is the Ahmedabad India BRT that we designed. Uh, in the United States, only uh, Cleveland and Eugene, Oregon have at-level boarding. So this is a very easy thing to do. It's surprising, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, this makes all the difference in the world. I know you've probably been on a bus where somebody's getting on in a wheelchair, it takes probably a couple of minutes. Um, it turns out that disallowing turning movements across your busway uh, is more important than traffic signal priority. It's very simple to do, it doesn't cost any money, but politically, uh, people don't like to not be able to turn. So is the Silver Line BRT? Well, according to the BRT standard, it, it isn't. It doesn't have several of the most critical uh, elements of what we consider BRT. So Boston can obviously do better. Uh, the best BRT system, according to the BRT standard, is Cleveland, and uh, Joe Calabrese deserves a lot of the credit for that. Um, <coughs> Curitiba was the first BRT system. 
Uh, this is what BRT was for most of the world from the 1980s until about 2000 uh, when Bogota opened. It could move about 16,000 passengers per direction per hour uh, by using an articulated bus. Uh, when Bogota opened in 2001, it introduced multiple substops and passing lanes and the capacity of that system uh, increased to 36,000 passengers per direction at the peak hour, which is more than most metro systems. So using bus-based mass transit technology, all of a sudden people who were thinking of building metro systems realized that they didn't need to and they could build uh, much cheaper systems using uh, bus technology. This is the secret. Uh, one bus, uh, an ex this allows express buses to pass this station. It allows this bus to pass this bus and it avoids the station from saturating, which is usually the cause of a bottleneck in a very high demand system. So the old view of capacity was that if you had more than 12,000 passengers per direction, you needed a metro. And now with uh, a, a large number of express bus services, BRT can handle up to 50 or 60,000 passengers per direction, which is more than any corridor in the world actually has outside of uh, Latin America. The cost of BRT is, generally speaking, much cheaper than light rail or metro. Uh, usually it's a fifth to a tenth of the price, although the Boston Waterfront Silver Line, uh, because it dug a, a tunnel under the harbor, ended up costing about $80 million a mile, and as a result, uh, skews the chart. But the Cleveland BRT was only about $5 million uh, per mile, making it one of the most cost-effective mass transit investments in the country. If you took a billion dollars of uh, capital money uh, and you invested it in, this was a study done in, in Bangkok, you could build seven kilometers of subway, uh, 14 kilometers of elevated rail, 40 kilometers of light rail, and 426 kilometers of BRT. This mathematics is why uh, much of the world uh, in these fiscally constrained times is going for bus rapid transit. Uh, the speeds of mass transit systems, uh, bus rapid, these are speeds of all of the, uh, a bunch of the light rails and BRT systems across the world. Uh, they vary, you know, depending mostly on how long the distance is between the station stops. There's no technology speed advantage for one system or the other. Uh, bus rapid transit can be constructed much faster. Uh, than rail-based systems, just that uh, engineering is much simpler. Uh, we did a, a big analysis of the amount of transit-oriented development that the transit investment stimulated. Um, and what we found was that, uh, that the two systems in the United States that leveraged the most transit-oriented development were Portland's uh, Blue Line and Cleveland's Health Line. Uh, but per dollar of transit investment, uh, the Cleveland Health Line leveraged $114 uh, dollars of transit-oriented development investment for every dollar invested in the transit system, while the Portland Blue Line only leveraged $3 of transit investment for every dollar of transit investment, simply because the transit investment was so much cheaper. But it turned out what really led to the big TOD impact was the degree to which the city and state government got its act together and put in a lot of other incentives and changed the zoning and, and really promoted those sites. Um, we're seeing a phenomenon internationally that the countries that have been investing in bus rapid transit have been able to keep their mass transit systems uh, are growing at a pace with their urban population. So we created this metric called uh, uh, mass transit kilometers per million urban residents. And what we found was that Colombia, which has built BRT systems uh, in most of its major cities, uh, has really dramatically improved access to mass transit nationally. Uh, Brazil has done an okay job. Mexico is doing great. Uh, and the countries that you would think are doing great, like China, which has built this massive amount of infrastructure in metros, uh, isn't really doing that great in terms of meeting its uh, urban population needs uh, because metros are just simply so expensive. Um, 
the, the, when you look at the total quantity and quality of bus rapid transit being built internationally, you find also a big variance. Uh, using the, B, the BRT standard, we find that the best quality BRTs are being built in Colombia because they're emulating Transmillennial. Uh, Brazil's doing okay. Mexico's doing really well with silver standard. Uh, this is the United States, so we're very far behind. This little sliver down here of silver standard BRT is Cleveland. Um, so we have a long way to go. So uh, ITDP and our president, Enrique Peñalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, work with cities that are interested in developing very high quality BRT systems because they tend to be the most transformative of cities. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the quality of the station, but of course it also has to bring a, a dramatic improvement to the transportation needs of the city. These are two systems. This, by the way, is Peñalosa bicycle riding with Mar Eduardo Pais of Rio. Um, Brazil had not built a new BRT system uh, since Curitiba. Uh, that was opened in the 1980s uh, until Eduardo Pais, inspired by Peñalosa, opened the Transoeste BRT system in Rio uh, t uh, two years ago. And uh, this uh, is the new Transcarioca BRT that opened last month uh, just in time for the World Cup. Uh, this is the new uh, BRT system in the city center of Belo Horizonte, uh, Brazil, another World Cup city, another city where Penulosa met the mayor and convinced him to push for BRT. They didn't have a lot of time, they didn't have a lot of money to get ready for the World Cup and uh, similarly you'll see that Johannesburg had a similar motivation. Uh, and uh, this was the nice station they built downtown. Originally the BRT was going to terminate at the edge of the city center and we went in and convinced them that if they pushed it right into the city center, it would be better for the people, but it would also revitalize the deteriorating downtown. And the, they're very happy with the results. Uh, this is the silver standard BRT in Ahmedabad, India, that we designed. It's the best system in India. It's now about 80 kilometers long. This is the gold standard bus rapid transit system we designed in Guangzhou, China. This is the uh, this particular station is the highest demand BRT station in the world. Um, <clears throat> there are about 25,000 passengers per direction per hour passing through this corridor. And in terms of transit-oriented development impacts, this is what that corridor looks like uh, today. Most of these buildings have been built in the last two years in anticipation of the Guangzhou BRT system having been built. So this is the kind of transformation that's happening in China, that's happening in the developing world. Uh, the Guangzhou system started construction in 2008, and it was finished by 2010. The Yichang BRT system, which we designed, uh, we started the design process last year, and it's going to be finished by the end of this year. Uh, San Francisco has been talking about BRT since about 2004, uh, and their BRT system has just been put off till uh, 2018. So we have a problem in the United States, which is that we tend to talk everything to death. And at a certain point, uh, our competitors in China and India are building BRT systems in two years. So, you know, if we want to actually get something done here, uh, we need to roll up our sleeves, decide what we want to do, you know, get everybody on board and do it. A big part of that is to uh, push your BRT systems through the narrow streets of downtown. That's where most people want to go. They want to go downtown. How can we put BRT in a downtown when the streets are narrow? Well, if there's a lot of buses already on that street, they're already congesting the street. So most cities are putting BRTs right through very narrow streets. They have to get rid of the other traffic on those streets but usually there's a parallel street that people can take. So in downtown Boston, for instance, there are plenty of those little narrow streets downtown that would make very nice uh, uh, transit malls, like we have in New York. We have a transit mall on Fulton Street, uh, and the traffic would go on parallel streets. This is you know, done all over the world. 
this is the transit mall that's under construction in Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania. It's going to open next year. This is a, that's a system that we were very instrumental in designing. <coughs> this is a conversation I'm having with uh, Mayor Brard of Mexico City, trying to convince him to push their BRT system through the historical core, and he's telling me, our city streets are too narrow, there's historical buildings, we can't possibly do it. And I said, well, no, actually, you can't actually get into your historical core because it just takes forever and the whole thing is deteriorating. This is what the historical center of Mexico City looked like uh, before, and this is now after they, they, they implemented the BRT line through the historical core. The property values are going through the roof. Uh, the crime is down. The residential population is recovering. Uh, this is Johannesburg, which pushed its BRT through the historical core of the city. That part of the city is revitalizing. The crime is dropping. These become nodes of security in an otherwise pretty dangerous environment. The station of a BRT is the identity. It becomes a piece of public art. If you put in a great piece of public art, it creates a public space. It's placemaking. Uh, it gives a new iconic image to the city and the property values can improve around it. This is the space for architects in a BRT system. Uh, this is the BRT station that's under construction in Dar es Salaam along the waterfront. It's not that beautiful, but it's a, it's a Tanzanian architect uh, and it's something that they, they all like. So these are the Johannesburg stations. Curitiba, Brazil was designed by an architect. Jaime Lerner is an architect. These tubular stations became quite iconic. Um, <coughs> we work with the, with the Brisbane station designer, Derek Trussler, uh, who developed, uh, who does a lot of station design work for us. It's very detailed. You really have to look at the functionality of the station, work with your engineers, uh, but you also might want to think, well, what is of this place? Uh, so this is a system that we're developing in Vientiane in Laos, and he uh, very much liked the baskets and the weaving, and it's become, it's sort of a symbol of that country. And he came up with this design, and we are uh, convinced them to push it right through the city center, and architects worked with us to develop these nice images to help sell it to the public. So Vientiane is very excited about this, the ADBs. Uh, given them a $200 million loan to build the system, and it has the potential to transform uh, the entire city. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we're hoping might be possible uh, here in Boston. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the Boston Society of Architects, the Bar Foundation, and all of those who've um, made it possible for me to join you here this evening. Um, you will forgive me, it's kind of 25 to 1 in the morning at home, so if I'm somewhat incoherent, um, I trust you'll, you'll understand. Uh, my presentation is, is going to be very different to, to Walter's, um, because I'm going to put BRT in context for... Johannesburg and for South Africa. Uh, and hopefully in doing that give you some sense uh, that Ria Vaya, the bus rapid transit project in Johannesburg, uh, was for us a lot more than a transit project. Um, but of course, I'm assuming, maybe let's just see how many architects in the room tonight. Okay, so, so we're talking to architects and I was saying to Cheryl that um, Exactly one week ago uh, today, I lost my eldest uncle, uh, who by profession was an architect. Uh, and he, had s he was so looking forward to getting feedback from, from this conference. Um, and so in reflecting a little bit on, on architecture, uh, really my sense that uh, we all live and move um, in terms of this code within the limitations, sight, and influence of architecture at home, at school, at church, and at work. And the influence of the architecture with which we're surrounded influences our perspectives on life. Uh, certainly having been schooled uh, in an asbestos building, uh, because that was what apartheid policy decided, uh, in a group area 
uh, specifically meant for South Africans of Indian descent some 40 kilometers south of Johannesburg. The architecture of that space and the experience of my own family in relation to transit um, shaped in many ways my own understanding um, of the kind of world that I didn't want. And when I had the opportunity um, in 2006 uh, to work in some way to, in the smallest of ways, use transit to overcome design that in fact was intended deliberately at a policy level to separate and isolate, um, to do everything then in my power to work with professional teams to ensure uh, that we used the opportunity to fundamentally change the lives of people. So if you haven't visited South Africa and if you haven't visited Johannesburg and if you don't know apartheid, it really was a system designed to keep people apart very deliberately because when you keep people apart, they don't know each other and then they fear each other and by virtue of that fear, you can keep a system based on, on race going. So apartheid design was very deliberate. A central business district surrounded by a white suburb with massive buffer zones, usually highways, and big empty spaces. And then on the periphery of that, but close enough to be able to get people to travel to the CBD every day so that you could use their labor power, was what were called townships that look pretty much like that. Really dormitory townships where people were sent to sleep on a daily basis. In, at a point in time, these would be predominantly males living here in single-sex hostels and so on and so forth. Uh, and this would be the image of a white suburb, um, very green. Johannesburg is known as an urban forest in its northern suburbs. Uh, but this is the contradiction of space. And of course, come the 27th of April 94 and the advent of our democracy, um, apartheid spatial transformation didn't change overnight. Last Thursday, at exactly this time, um, I was fortunate enough to be part of an event at the Apartheid Museum uh, in Johannesburg where two of the remaining trialists from the Ravonia trial, which is the trial that sentenced Nelson Mandela and others to lifetime imprisonment, uh, Dennis Goldberg and Ahmed Kathrada addressed us about that very moment. It was the 50th anniversary of the day of their sentencing. And they had well expected that what they would get would be the death sentence. Um, of course, as fate would have it, it was a life sentence and they would go on to actually see the liberation of the country. But Dennis Goldberg made a remark that I'd never thought about before. This particular picture is on the day that Nelson Mandela was released in 1990. And it's just behind you there is Victor Fester prison in Pau uh, that he was released from. And this is probably one of the first pictures that was taken uh, as Nelson Mandela became a free man. But Dennis Goldberg said, you see, Mandela had the choice to have his car drive through the gates of Victor Fister prison. What he chose to do, in fact, was to have the car stop, open the door, climb out, and walk on his own two feet to his freedom. And I thought that that was a fundamental symbol for the importance um, of walking for any city. Now, apartheid was really about keeping people apart. Um, on the transit system, so this is a sign in Afrikaans um, in relation to um, non-whites only in this area, that section is for white people only and you can see that over there. Uh, okay, we, we have a massive congestion problem in Johannesburg and that congestion doesn't reveal the fact that two-thirds of Johannesburg households do not have access to a private car. So two-thirds of households are public transport captive. Of course, everyone aspires to own a car because the car is a massive status symbol like it is in so many places in the world. But what had happened is in the period that the apartheid government was not providing for the transit needs of the vast majority of its people, 
was the advent of the minibus taxi. 14 to 18 seater vehicles, 12,000 legal vehicles in Johannesburg, many more illegal ones, uh, providing for the daily mobility needs of the vast majority of the residents of Johannesburg. Um, generally quite easy in terms of you just step out on a sidewalk and raise your finger and a taxi is likely to stop. Um, however, safety record is poor, maintenance of vehicles is poor, and there's high levels of competition on routes and for routes, and often in that competition, it ends up in violence and commuters end up losing their lives in that situation. So this is the background against which Johannesburg was looking at bus rapid transit. The concept was introduced to us in 2006, uh, November 2006, 26th of November, the City of Johannesburg Council approved the implementation of bus rapid transit. And on the 30th of August 2009, less than three years later, the system was opened, 25.5 kilometers of dedicated routing, uh, some 34 stations. Um, and in that picture is the National Minister of Transport, the Premier of the province, and the uh, Executive Mayor of the City of Johannesburg, as well as the Deputy Minister of transport in the city. Uh, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide, not necessarily explaining the pictures, but giving some sense from the Johannesburg experience of some of the key ingredients uh, that are important for any city, irrespective of your context, if you were doing a bus rapid transit system. The first one, no doubt, is political will. Uh, mayor Masondo, who was the mayor between 2000 and 2006, returned to office uh, 2006 to 2011, very wisely elevated both transport and environment to standalone portfolios. So transport used to be part of the development planning, transportation and environment portfolio. The mayor elevated transport to a standalone and elevated environment to a standalone. The mayor was also very clear. We are hosting the World Cup in 2010. There will be a final whistle of the 2010 World Cup. The games will come and go. The guests will come and leave. And long after the guests have left the shores of our country, what are the projects that we will look back on, which we would have done ordinarily as the city of Johannesburg, but hosting the World Cup would create that level of urgency. Having the pressure of the world watching you means how do you use that pressure? And the mayor led very successfully a series of legacy projects, and Ria Vaya was one of them. But of course, that visionary leadership was not restricted to the city. Pictured here are Mr. Eric Motswane and the late Mr. Sitelo Mabaso, um, both leaders in the minibus taxi sector. And of course, for these gentlemen, getting behind a project that the city was proposing, not knowing what the final outcome would be, was literally life-threatening. So they'd had attempts on their lives. Uh, they lost their positions of leadership at a point in time. Uh, but they were able to, through the study tours that we had done, uh, some of them thanks to the ITDP, um, to begin to see that their, the, their own narrow interests as an industry um, were not enough for city growth going forward. And I think what you had there was really a partnership between the city of Johannesburg and the minibus taxi sector, which many have never been able to understand how that partnership happened. And in many ways, that partnership was about authentic conversation, uh, about a vision bigger than any individual or any grouping in the equation. And that, that partnership is really what enabled us to get the project moving. Walter's already spoken to the importance of stations. Um, in our instance, we had quite an interesting journey with the stations. Uh, the architectural firm that been, had been appointed and had won the tender uh, had come with some drawings. And we were saying, so where's the people's voice in what this is going to look like? And we insisted that the architectural firm have a public participation session with stakeholder interest groups. 
And of course, at this time, South Africa did not have a bus rapid transit system. So we were showing videos and showing photographs, uh, as Walt has just done, from other bus rapid transit systems. And we were saying, this is what we would like to do. And people were like, what? A station in the middle of the road? Are you guys insane? Um, and we had long and difficult conversations with communities, but the architects were very interested in also getting the views of communities and incorporating that into the final design. Of course, ultimately, Riavaya is about commuters. Um, whilst the key ingredients for Riavaya and many of the objectives of the project spoke to a range of issues in the city's growth and development strategy, economic growth, environmental issues, social cohesion, uh, the big quest was really about improving the dignity of existing and current users of public transport, but also creating a transit system that could be sufficiently attractive to get people out of their private cars onto the public transport system. And so the system had to be able to do both. So certainly political will, community involvement, partnership, um, Strong technical teams, good international advisory teams, all helped uh, in terms of getting us to the point of being able to open the system. But of course it wasn't easy. And if I had to stand here going through the range of obstacles that were faced in the duration of the project, we might be here till very late tonight. But this is just an example of how the project almost held a national election in 2009 in March, we had the national elections in the country. And the Riavaya project almost held an entire national election to ransom. The election was on a Wednesday. On the Monday, the national taxi industry called the then president of the ANC, subsequently and now president of the country, President Zuma, to a meeting and said, Johannesburg is doing this thing called bus rapid transit. Uh, we don't want it, and if you don't make sure that you stop it, you can be rest assured we won't be transporting voters to the polls anywhere in the country. Uh, President Zuma then, two days before the election, simply said, um, let's hold horses for now. We had already built stations, we had procured buses, we were ready to run the service for the Confederations Cup, and it was a particularly difficult period in trying to interpret what did this hold horses for now mean? Um, and of course, in the period of construction and getting to the point of operationalization and beyond, um, lives were lost in the taxi industry. Um, buses were shot at, commuters were killed. Um, there was an attack on, on my own home. Um, and so it was a particularly difficult period. And so often, you know, when I visit European cities, or American cities, um, you know, if with all of this, if we could get it done, there's really no reason why it can't happen in your context. You certainly are not going to be facing any of those issues. And so the birth of Riavaya has also given birth uh, to a new concept which Mayor Tao, who is now the mayor of Johannesburg, um, has dubbed Corridors of Freedom which is really about moving away from an apartheid, spatially segregated city to a city where all feel welcome, where road space, which is the greatest public shared space in a city, is available to all categories of users, whether you're a pedestrian, whether you're a cyclist, whether you're a public transport user, and inverting the planning of cities and the pyramid used to plan cities and turning that on its head and saying, we will unashamedly put the pedestrian first, the cyclist second, the public transport user third. And that does mean, unfortunately, that the one person, one car culture and the private car user will be somewhat lower on our rung of priorities. Um, I do invite you at any point uh, to visit Johannesburg, visit South Africa. It is indeed um, an amazing country uh, with amazing spirit. Um, and uh, we trust that something in our journey will resonate uh, with some of you and that hopefully for, for Boston at some point. Um, you know, I, w I went on the tour this afternoon with uh, one of your trolley duck buses and then uh, onto the ferry. And... Um, 
kind of it's a standing joke about your transport and the amount of time that people are spending, quality time that should be spent with loved ones, time that should be spent doing things that you creatively are able to do, and people are spending it frustrated in traffic. Um, so hopefully your journey will be an exciting one and uh, that you will in fact get communities on the side of the project, that you will get decision makers and business people on the side of the project. Ultimately, we owe it to generations to come to make sure that we leave them a better world than the one that we found. Thank you. And that was, that was moving. Um, I'm going to follow up that uh, eight slides with probably 108 slides as part of my presentation. If we can uh, find out where my, where my thing is. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Joe Calabrese, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a politician. I'm kind of an operator. Um, with that, maybe, maybe a little marketing spin. Uh, to me, I want to tell you about what we did in Cleveland. It worked out well. We, we did not have a great book about how to do BRT right. Uh, we did not have great examples. We had light rail. And a lot of, our, I think, our success and the recognition of our programs because we kind of modeled it after light rail. And that's why you'll hear me use the term rail like a lot. So uh, that, that's why it turned out that way. And I think that's certainly a, a great model to use in the future. A little bit about Cleveland RTA. We're not as big as the T. Spent a lot of time here in Boston with the MBTA. but. We serve about 1.5 million people in our service area, about 200,000 customers a day, about 2,500 employees. It was 3,200 when I arrived in Cleveland in 2000, so we had to do some downsizing. And during that process, we're trying to build and design this BRT system, which was somewhat of a, of a challenge. We have a pretty comprehensive bus network. Most of our bus service is focused in the downtown. Uh, most of our service is work-related, like most are very little suburb-to-suburb -suburb service. A, a bus fleet you might find in every major city. We have park and ride service. Uh, the, the, the mainstay is certainly the 40-foot 40 40 foot transit bus. Uh, we have uh, the first um, more than 40-foot vehicles in Cleveland, actually in Ohio, were the rapid transit vehicles for the health line. There was actually a law in the state of Ohio we couldn't buy a vehicle more than 40 foot long, which we ultimately changed. That, didn't, that wasn't because of highway safety, it was because there was a bus manufacturer in Ohio and there was a law saying we couldn't buy anything that company didn't make, which was obviously against the law law, but we had to abide by it and, and got it changed. Rail network, uh, again, the uh, uh, light rail system uh, dates back. We, we uh, again, not as old as the T, but the uh, light rail system turned 100 years old last December 16th. The, uh, the red line, the heavy rail system was primarily built in the 1950s. We did a little rail extension in 1996 to take the rail system out to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the new Brown Stadium. Uh, it's a system much bigger than, than I think our population. Cleveland was once the fifth largest city in the country. Now it's like number 45, but a lot of the infrastructure, both in public transit and highways, is based on that, that bigger city. It's why we have very little traffic congestion, which makes my job a little more difficult. A heavy rail system, again, the first uh, a uh, system to run rail from Center City to the airport in 1968. Some of you might remember the name UMTA. It was the first UMTA grant, really, was to extend the rail line to the airport back then. Uh, again, the light rail system. But most of my time will be spent talking about the health line uh, on Euclid Avenue. Euclid Avenue was Cleveland's main street, a very great street, a very great street for public transportation. As you can see by these photos, those were really the, the good old days. Uh, the streetcars disappeared in 1954, replaced by the number six bus line. It was a great bus line, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that was primarily 99.9% .9 transit dependent riders and really was not encouraging the non transit dependent rider to use it. It was great service, poor image. Uh, and almost immediately, people said, What are we going to do to revitalize Euclid Avenue to make this a better system? Um, a lot of that push, unlike a lot of areas, was not by my customers. My customers were happy with the number six bus, that's all they ever knew, but really with, with the businesses along Euclid Avenue that saw the land values decrease, their vacancy rate go up, and wanted and hoped that a transit investment could do more, kind of revitalize that area. So maybe a little different, the big pushers, were this really were the, business, the, the Chamber of Commerce types, not the transit riders. But we did a lot of study work, 
what could be done. The voters actually voted in a subway back in the 1950s after the trolleys went away. It was going to be a $1 billion system. Back then, a billion was like real money, and it never happened. Uh, but again, ongoing, what do we do? And, and again, we did the normal uh, alternatives analysis. We felt we had to serve about 30,000 people a day. Wanted that connectivity. We're looking for something we can get federal funding for because we knew we couldn't we'd do this on our own. Uh, so both capital and operating costs are very important to us. And as I mentioned, the big driver was economic development. Um, we had one person who was instrumental in, in making this project happen. Many people worked on it, but probably the primary person was a former mayor, um, George Voinovich. He was actually a county commissioner before he was mayor. Uh, he then became governor, George Voinovich, and, and at that time went down to Curitiba on some trade mission and saw the BRT system there and called back and told the chamber to come on down or this might be the solution for Euclid Avenue. Uh, that happened. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, I, at, at this point in time, I arrived on the screen at the scene not knowing what BRT was. Uh, there were a few people in the community saying it should be rail or nothing, uh, but you know, taking the cues and, and say, well, well, how can we make this rubber tired alternative, a lower cost alternative, as rail-like as possible, and really use rail as the example for how we designed the system because we, we didn't have the book on, on how, to, how to meet gold, silver, or bronze standard. Um, we took a 9.4-mile corridor that had 108 bus stops. We combined those stops to 36 stations. We reduced travel time from 40 minutes to 28 based on the number of, of, uh, of characteristics you'll hear about. It was much more than a public transit project. Building face to building face, sidewalks, curbs, roadway, uh, sewer lines, water lines, irrigation, uh, um, significant effort in pedestrian and, and bike lanes. So it was really a very, very comprehensive project. This is one of the pictures, one of the, the shots I used in, in hundreds of public meetings trying to describe what we were doing. And I said, we're trying to, to transform Euclid Avenue from this picture to this. Okay, that was the vision. The vision is, you know, dilapidated in ruins, but we're going to put a median, exclusive lanes, redo the pavement, redo the sidewalks, bury the overhead wires, new traffic lights, new signal lights, uh, 1,500 irrigated trees. That was kind of the vision and the mission. Uh, it happened. Uh, this is then Governor George Voinovich, but this, at this point in time, he's Senator George Voinovich uh, trying to make sure this happened. We talked a little bit about politics. We had a lot of planning. We have a lot of efforts, but this happened in October 2004, right before a very important presidential election. You all know Ohio is a very important swing state. And yes, we did push that political boundary as much as we could. And uh, uh, Norm Mineta, the secretary, came out to give us the full funding grant agreement. Uh, governor Taft took over for Governor Voinovich. When Governor Voinovich was the, was the governor and, and, and went down to Curitiba, he said, I will pledge you some state money to help fund this project. I will give you the local share, which is very important to us. And when he became senator, he held um, uh, Governor Taft, who is of the same party, uh, to, that, uh, to that promise, which was great. At one point in time, it was going to be an 80-20 project, like many FTA-funded projects are. Uh, they started going away from that during our design process. Uh, matter of fact, I got a call from the, uh, the uh, um, FTA uh, director uh, one, one day and said, uh, as it was Jenna Dorn, the FTA administrator said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news, we're, we would love to, uh, to, uh, to move you into final design and construction. The bad news is we're going from an 80-20 project to a 50-50 project. You've got 10 days to let me know if you're going to do it or not, which meant we had a little budgeting challenge. Uh, we filled that budgeting challenge with the city and, and the MPO and, uh, and, and really made it happen. Um, one of the reasons I have a lot of visitors coming to Cleveland to look at the BRT system, there's three different configurations on one avenue and one corridor. This is a, uh, a rendering of the downtown, uh, the lower Euclid Avenue, the, the more downtown portion, where the stations are in the, mid the middle of the street. Uh, and again, in, in the rail vernacular, this serves both inbound and outbound bus rapid transit vehicles. We call them rapid transit vehicles. We do not call them buses. We refer to BRT as better rapid transit, not bus rapid transit. In my vernacular, bus is a four-letter word in America. When I got to Cleveland, uh, I was told, hey, Joe, you're not in New York anymore. In Cleveland, suits don't ride buses. So we, we don't do the bus thing. We do the brand thing. These are rapid transit vehicles uh, on the health line. Um, so this is a station in, in the downtown Cleveland. Again, serves both inbound and outbound customers. Uh, the rapid transit vehicles have five doors, three on the right, two on the left. 
Here they're like rail cars have doors on the right and left. People say, well, you can't get a vehicle with doors on both sides. Only rail cars have, vehicle, have doors on both sides. Well, this is designed like a rail vehicle would, like a light rail system would. Um, again, uh, significant design work on the sidewalks, brick pavers, the street lights, the trees, as you can see here. We didn't eliminate legal parking on Euclid Avenue. We put it in pockets. We put it in the right location. We worked with business after business saying, do you want parking or do you want wider sidewalks? And many wanted wider sidewalks, which was great for us. In the Midtown corridor, the Midtown portion, which is the largest corridor, we did things a little differently. Um, again, it's not one single station that serves inbound and outbound customers. They're station pairs. So the BRT vehicle will cross the intersection to a far side stop and board at this location, conversely coming in the other direction, cross the, the intersection and board here. Now here we can board on the right side of the vehicle, the more traditional bus side of the vehicle, where there are three doors. The reason we did it differently here was a couple reasons. Here I could have other bus routes come onto Euclid Avenue and use this infrastructure. Use exclusive lanes, use the traffic signal prioritization, use the level boarding, use the precision docking. So I was getting a bigger bang for my dollar. This would really improve not just what was the number six line, but five or six other bus lines as well with the investment. Um, kind of a shot uh, with the, uh, the turn lanes. Every, every turn movement is independently signalized, again, with the bike lanes. Not the entire length, but the majority of the length. Importantly, it connects two major universities on Euclid Avenue. Um, in one portion, the farthest east portion of Euclid Avenue, we lost our ability to have exclusive lanes, which was disheartening, but we just put our head down and kept moving forward. The signal system has a queue jump for the vehicle, goes into the curb line, operates in mixed, mixed traffic with, with still a lot of the same amenities. The, serv the service certainly slows down there, but it was the only option we have, and it still works very well for us. That rail-like characteristics I talk about, again, quicker travel time, that quicker travel time, was really achieved by a number of things was mentioned, the exclusive right of way, our exclusive lanes. Our speed limit in our lanes is 35 miles per hour versus 25 miles per hour in the general use lanes. The traffic signal system, precision docking, level boarding, off-board fare collection, all things to reduce that, that, that dwell time. The rail-like service, high frequency, 24-7, five minutes in the peak. The vehicles were very important to us. I think, as was mentioned, the two things that I thought were really important were the stations and the, and the vehicles, because at the end of the day, those were going to look like something the municipality did, and the stations, the vehicles were going to be really continuing signs of, of the transit systems. A lot of technology, just you know, again that that image, that brand. Um, when I was standing listening to our light rail system, it come, came into stations with that ding, 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 and I said, well, that's kind of rail-like brand. So we had that same, put that same horn in the rapid transit vehicles as well to give it that same brand, that same image, that same feel, feel stimulating the senses in the same way. A lot of technology. Uh, here's the, the signal head for the uh, exclusive lanes. Again, it's not a red, yellow, green. It's the rail signal head we use on our rail system to direct our operators. Precision docking, which is something both uh, mechanical and through a sensor. We stole from Essen, Germany, and Leeds, England. So the vehicle pulls in. The little docking arm touches the 15-inch touches the, uh, the, the, the curb. Very simple, mechanical, pulls in very close. Very simple on and off for, again, reduce that dwell time uh, considerably. The off-board fare collection, there are ticket vending machines and validators at every station. Uh, as was mentioned, our transit police do the validation. That does a couple things. It makes the system secure, get that perception of security where the transit police officers on a random basis can get on saying, can I please see your valid, your valid fare. <clears throat> a lot of technologies, real-time information at every station, uh, call boxes, cameras at the stations, cameras along the quarters, 12 cameras in each vehicle. Again, the perception of safety and rea reality of safety is very important to us. Station design was mentioned, very important. These are not bus stops. Uh, a lot of concern about not taking away from some of the great architecture in Cleveland, as there is also here in Boston. Wanted something that was utilitarian, that was pretty substantial, that was easy to clean and maintain. Very pleased with what we ended up with. Uh, again, very different for us. Um, the vehicle was probably, not probably, the vehicle was the biggest challenge. You can see here attempt number four. Initially, uh, we were doing a joint procurement with the MBTA for the Silver Line. This was going to be called the Silver Line initially. Um, a vehicle manufacturer was selected. It was a European manufactured Neoplan. We went to Europe to see the vehicle. We, we rode the vehicle. I had some major concerns about a couple of things. One was cost. One was the reputation of the manufacturer. 
But more importantly was that image, that brand, this does not look rail-like. So, you know, we did not like it. This was uh, actually the latest vehicle that was delivered in Seattle uh, by a company called New Flyer. They're actually the biggest bus company in, uh, in North America. Um, and our fourth attempt, uh, there were some great European vehicles we were interested in, but we could not buy them because they didn't meet the federal Buy America standards. So we were kind of relegated to something that looked kind of like this. Now, this was a great vehicle. Seattle loved them. They just put a big order in for 240 of them. They worked well, hybrid electric propulsion. Again, did not look like something we wanted to use. We actually spent some design money, about $1.9 million, with New Flyer to design a new vehicle. Mostly skin, mostly cosmetics, but we transformed that vehicle into something that was more rail-like than anything the industry had seen before. We didn't get all the way we wanted to get. We probably got 70% of the way, but it's a very, very significant imposing vehicle when you see it, but it's much more rail-like, that rapid transit vehicle, than anything we, we've seen. A lot of landscaping I mentioned, uh, which really I think makes the corridor really great. Attention to detail, right down to 108 new garbage cans. Again, really wanted to totally remake Euclid Avenue into what it was. I mentioned better rapid transit. Again, the characteristics of rail, the permanence, image, and service levels, and that flexibility and, and cost of a bus system, which is really what made it work. How do we brand it? Uh, again, not a bus, not a train, it's the future. That rail-like image, talked about business development, talked about faster commute, talked about more jobs, and talked about clean, green energy. So some of the ways we kind of branded, th these were large posters, like 10 foot by 20 foot, that were in storefronts of it on Euclid Avenue during construction to try to, uh, to push that. Um, strong community support, I mentioned that was the big push here. This was really an economic development engine. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was, was strongly behind this. Uh, Toby Cosgrove is president of the largest company in Cleveland, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, second largest company in the state, second to Walmart. Uh, but, but really, he's the 800-pound gorilla of business in, in, in Ohio and in Cleveland. He was one of the proponents and the spokespeople for this project to get really the community involved. Dr. Toby Cosgrove, heart surgeon and CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. I cannot stress enough the importance of healthy arteries. The entire system depends on them to function properly. BRT project developed economic development the way light rail could. And, and that was a question that really hadn't been answered before. It certainly had not been answered in the U.S. It was something we could not answer till it was built. So it was kind of a little scary there, but, but, but it did. Um, I had a visit, I don't know about the, the reporters here, but had a visit from our local senior reporter in Cleveland. We were going out giving presentations, talking about 2.5 billion of economic development was already underway because of our project. So I got a visit saying we want to do our own research. We don't believe you where the numbers come from. We gave them our data and he proved me wrong. This was the article two Sundays hence. And the number was 4.3 billion, not 2.5 billion. So I said to Steve, Steve, you're right, I was wrong, but I'm going to use your figure from now on. And the difference between figures is we were looking at the development on Euclid Avenue. He looked a quarter of a mile either side of Euclid Avenue. But again, great. You, you can't beat this front page Sunday headlines and photo of all the development happening up and down the quarter and what it meant to the area. This is an area, again, this is during the recession, so things were very positive. Um, Tracy Nichols is our Director of Economic Development. Uh, she could not make it here today, but a few words from, uh, from Tracy. Well, when developers come with us and they're riding on that helpline, the first thing they say... Well, when developers come with us and they're riding on that helpline, the first thing they say is, wow, right on that helpline, they see all the things that we have going as far as development is concerned, and people are just flabbergasted. We have so many people wanting to come here and ask, how are we doing it? And I will tell you, the diamond in the tiara is the health line and all of the development along the health line. Um, people ask, well, how do you know this development is because of what you did? I'm very open to say, I think it's not what we did. It's that other people leveraged what we did. Private developers leveraged, put their money. They speculated the good old American way, and it paid off. Uh, Dick Pace is a developer. He called me up and said, Joe, where are the stations going? I want to buy a building there. So I mean, that's how I know there was that relationship. The two things we were interested in was certainly development, redeveloping buildings on Euclid Avenue, but most important, even more importantly, those people that occupied those buildings, we wanted them to be users of the health line. So Dick will talk about both those things. Without the health line, we never would have uh, made the investment. One is that the 
uh, tenants use a health line. Um, the second part is the reinvestment, and that, that leap, of, leap of faith by the city and RTA to invest in Euclid Avenue. Uh, it's made a huge difference line that was called the dual hub project at times was really connect downtown and university circle the area that was the biggest winner was really that midtown area between the two and i know when when we came out and andy the impressive thing was there's development along the entire project not just downtown in this midtown area the only pro uh, the only activity for the last 20 years was land banking taking old abandoned factories and, and tearing them down and land banking now this land banking came in handy you know, you've got people now building new buildings, leasing them out, and building new buildings. This area has been a two to three times increase in property value since 2008. Um, there were some distractors. Uh, there, were, there, there were the rail people who said it should be rail or nothing, and to them, my response was that it will be nothing, which is not satisfactory. But really, those were the two options we had, a $200 million BRT project or a $1 billion light rail project that would never have gotten built. And if I had 100 if I had a billion dollars, I would have rather do five of these than one light rail project. But MRN, great aggressive group, young, smart, brilliant people who are downtown developers who came to me, see me one day and said, you know, you're, you're making a big mistake. If you want downtown to develop, if you want retail to develop, the, so, the solution is not more public transit, it's more parking. A and you should just build more parking. I said, well, there's no federal parking authority that want, is going to give me $200 million, so I've got to run vehicles. His next comment without blinking an eye is, do they have to stop? That, that, you know, that, that was the attitude. He is now one of our strong supporters. And, and I think Cleveland is, in fact, a model for uh, other communities that are working on uh, urban development uh, in many, many ways. Uh, transit is actually a really critical part of that. Uh, we're experiencing transit-oriented development. Uh, in all kinds of areas of the city, downtown obviously with East 4th Street and the potential for Public Square and, and those conversions, but also in University Circle uh, with the new stations for the Red Line and leveraging the health, uh, the health line, uh, we're seeing all kinds of transit-oriented development happening in the Circle right now. This is the development that Ari was talking about that uh, wasn't sh quite sure it would happen with, uh, with, with bus rapid transit without more parking. Obviously very, very successful. Uh, this is the other end of the line, and this is uh, Ari's latest developments. Uh, he bought property. Uh, this is a new Museum of Contemporary Art that is now open. These two buildings, first floor retail, three stories, uh, upper three stories, pretty expensive uh, uh, apartments and condos. Um, uh, this vacant parking lot now is Ari's third development, so he's invested in both sides uh, of the corridor, and, and again, very, very successfully. Here you see the finished product with the station adjacent adjacent to it. Um, a lot of the development's been small development, two, three, four story, not two, uh, three, four, five stories. Two major, um, uh, the employers on Euclid Avenue made major, major investments, uh, you know, eight, nine hundred million dollar investments. The University Hospital Center, again, on Euclid Avenue, you see the stations adjacent to that. And the Cleveland Clinic, uh, that Toby Cosgrove organization, uh, they actually got together as we're, we were, before we launched the project, and really bought the naming rights to this. It's the first public transit asset that sold naming rights like a stadium. We said, why not? What, we're as good as a stadium is. And uh, again, the clinic and UH partnered up to call the Silver Line uh, the Health Line. Again, 25 years of revenue to us. My pledge is the revenue we collect from this we will put back into the system in terms of flowers and plantings and station cleanings every day and, and comprehensive vehicle cleaning every day. So it's worked out really well, really well for us. We needed a new tagline, uh, pumping new life into the city seemed to work very well for us. We had an on-time and on-budget opening. Uh, it's now been really part of, of our total operation. The health line is more like my lifeline. We, we love that. Ridership went up 48% the first year. It's been growing about 6 to 8% every year. Since then, we celebrated its fifth anniversary uh, last December. Our customers are happy with the service. 13% um, used to be rail riders, and now they're bus rapid transit riders. It's just not what the vehicles, what the wheels are made of. It's how it's serving their individual needs. Little comparison of the capital costs going in to the project. Again, 200 million, which included a lot of not as a stuff, the water lines, the sewer lines, things like that. Um, the cost per passenger, someone asked today, isn't the cost of, of BRT higher than the cost of rail? It certainly is not higher. Uh, it's less than half of what it is on rail and, and almost half 
of what is on the bus. And the reason is I'm carrying 35 people per hour on my bus system. I'm carrying 75 people per hour on the health line. I'm carrying 92 customers per hour on, on the rail system. It really is, is capacity driven. Uh, the reason the rail is so much more expensive, it's the infrastructure cost. With BRT, I'm not maintaining the track, the signal, the right of way, the overhead catenary, all those other things one must maintain if it was a rail system. Again, I'm not anti-rail. I'm for what makes sense. Uh, it, it's worked well together, the stations, the vehicle, the landscaping. Uh, we're very pleased. The community's very pleased. We're about to launch our second BRT later this year. We've, we've got some great recognition. I want to thank those who have recognized us for that, and I look forward to answering some questions in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, Rahana, and Walter. We'd like to invite you up to the table now and open it up to audience questions. I'll be walking around with the mic. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I thought you were brave at first uh, to come here and talk about BRT in Boston. We all know about the silver line here, but I see you addressed that. <laughs> anyway, um, so I just wanted to uh, go back to a slide that was in the first presentation where you talked about how you could build, uh, let's say, it was it 426 kilometers of uh, BRT for the same cost as, let's say, was it 16 kilometers of light rail and seven of elevated, something like that. And I, I have a problem with those kinds of charts because I feel like they're um, confusing and fudging many details. For example, that 426 kilometers, was that brand new right of way or was that reusing existing right of way? And I have a few more questions. Um, and what, so actually I'll just keep going. So uh, was it, uh, are you building new right away? Are you taking lanes away from uh, existing uh, cars? So when you implied that seven kilometers of elevated rail cost the same, what you're saying is a seven kilometer new elevated right of way would cost that. But that doesn't have to do whether with the mode, it has to do with the fact that you're building a completely new elevated structure. And if you built this, for example, seven kilometers of elevated bus rapid transit, you would probably come with the same cost or even higher. So I feel like using such charts is a being a bit disingenuous because what the real problem here is, is space. And uh, if you can get you know, a city to give up all that space in terms of lanes, I mean, you could build anything in there for that co for pretty cheap. Uh, here in, in Boston, we have the this, this so-called Silver Line. And the big problem with the Silver Line is that the city was not willing to give up the space uh, to allow for real rapid transit. And therefore, it gets stuck in traffic uh, downtown Boston. And, uh, and for whatever reason, the, the, the tunnels they did construct are extremely slow. So um, in terms of... Um, what we really need isn't the, the technology is easy. We all know how to do this technology. It, what we really need is the political will to make this happen. And that's why I'm impressed by what uh, Joe did because he got uh, that car, you, you clearly took lanes away from general traffic to build that uh, health line. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. Um, I think th there are many factors. It's tough to say this is the cost, but I think from, from what I feel, again, not being the engineer, it's probably, Given doing it the same way, it's probably one-third the cost of rail to build it and one-third the cost to operate it, BRT, as opposed to rail. And one of the reasons we were able to get away with what we got away with is we said, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Uh, you know, we're gonna, we, we need that lane. And again, it was a strong business support and the property owner support who would, you may think would be the ones that would, would fight giving up the lane were supportive of this because they hoped it would generate the economic development. Can I also just say that there was a light rail project done about the same time as your uh, health line that, uh, in Houston, about the same size, but it only cost 300 million. So I'm not sure where how you get 800 million from that. But anyway, um, the other thing is I just think these BRT features should be applied across the board. It shouldn't just be for special new lines to apply uh, economic development somewhere. It should be for, it should be, it's an equity issue. It should be all over the city. Thank you, and <clears throat> thanks again for coming. We really appreciate it. 
Um, my question is for Joe. I, I noticed in the pictures that you did not restrict left turns across the tracks and instead elected to prioritize those. I'm, I'm glad you said tracks. You're thinking well, that rail-like already. I love it. That, uh, across the right-of-way. Um, but I noticed it looked, it looked to me like you actually had controlled left turns and their own signal that seemed to be coordinated with the with the movements of the buses. Is that true? We, 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 didn't, we didn't prohibit all left-hand turns. Uh, we probably eliminated two-thirds of the left-hand turns that were there. So again, we work with the city, work with the developers, work with the property owners to uh, maintain the ones that they felt were absolutely necessary. Uh, we do have the, again, every turn movement is signalized. And the biggest issue with accidents we have, again, BRT or light rail or trolleys, it doesn't matter, is left-hand turns in front of the vehicle. So it, is, it keeps our operators on their toes. It's, a, it's an issue. Um, I wish we didn't have any, but again, you've got to make, life is full of compromises. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the, another one of the challenges we have here in Boston is we don't have a lot of uh, very wide streets, and then a lot of the images we saw from Cleveland, it looked like the Health line was located in a corridor where Euclid might have been, you know, six or seven lanes wide. I'm wondering if there were any um, segments of that right of way that were a little bit more constrained. And in those cases, if you could talk about maybe some of the challenges you might have had if you were taking parking or travel lanes. Yeah, I, I think um, obviously that was a, um, a concern. Um, we needed a hundred foot right away to do what we did, and in some areas we. Most areas we had 100 feet. A couple areas we had to buy some some small slivers, really slivers of land. I think we bought like 300 parcels, but most of them were a couple of feet here and a couple of feet there to to really equalize that out. So that wasn't a major issue in the quarter. It became an issue out in that that uh, farthest east section. That's why we could not get an exclusive lane. Uh, things were just too built out and very difficult. Very different to build BRT in an area where you have a lot of expanse as opposed to where there are existing 20-story buildings. You really aren't going to move the, the buildings back. And, and, and one of the concerns was, uh, you know, we really tried to build this pedestrian-friendly as well. Um, uh, in that midtown area, uh, we were able, to, uh, again, to garner through our minimal purchases another 10-foot of right-of-way. That's why we could, could have the five-foot bike lanes through about, about you know, 70% of the quarter, which was really, really important for us to do. But space is an issue. Um, as visitors to our city, I'd be curious if you would like to delve into this question. If you don't want to answer it, please don't. But what advice would you give the community of Boston and maybe the state of Massachusetts to uh, move forward with implementing BRT beyond simply commenting oh, our, our streets are, and corridors are too narrow. In other words, um, in a political sense or a physical sense, what, what should we do? Well, I guess, um, uh, y you know, there's a whole study group going on that the Bar Foundation's been supporting, and we've been pretty involved in that and we've been working with MassDOT to sort of answer that very question. And, and what we would do is we would start with where you already have a lot of bus trips because on your corners where you've already got a lot of bus trips, the buses are already pretty much taking a lane of traffic uh, because they stop and start all the time. So if you dedicate a bus lane where there's already a lot of buses rolling up and down the road, you're not really causing any additional delay for the remainder of the traffic. Uh, and you already have a bus lane on Washington Street on the Silver Line. Now once you've got a dedicated lane, if you put it on the curb lane or you put it in the middle of the road, uh, it's still the same uh, dedicated lane. So you might as well put it in the middle as on the curb lane. Um, so probably the easiest place would be <clears throat> to just upgrade your existing Washington Avenue Silver Line to a, a really great BRT uh, and continue that corridor in both directions. You, you have a lot of, you know, you have enough width there. And in your downtown, you've got 
uh, some streets that don't really carry any significant amounts of traffic anyway. So you could you could create a a bus uh, you know a transit mall easily enough on one of your downtown streets. They don't serve any important traffic function. Uh, the other parts of your city are pretty tricky. You've got a lot of two by two roads, and so you know you're going to have to look at some solutions that other cities have used. You're going to have to think about one way pairs. You're going to have to think about uh, <clears throat> where where can you squeeze it in. And uh, but there 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 are ways of of doing it. Pretty much all over the city, you've got important links that. That you can uh, you can squeeze through there. We're we're looking pretty closely at how can we connect Harvard to uh, Dudley through the Fenway area and through the Longwood Medical Area. You've got a lot of development through that corridor and very narrow streets that all kind of want to go in the other direction. But we think we found links that that'll make it work and that there's some there, there's some really curious things going on with it. Half of the delay. Uh, getting into the Longwood medical area is because the buses are all rerouted a long way out of their way just because there's apparently like a museum or something they don't want the buses going in front of them and so it adds like this big delay for for no apparent reason and you know so it's like usually some kind of political thing so usually what you have to do is you have to kind of create an image of what the what you could have you know you want to like something really Im impressive you know the Light rail guys come in, they create this incredibly attractive image of sleek vehicles and total beautiful landscape and stations that make you dream, you know. And then the bus guys come in with something that looks kind of grotty and cheap, you know. Like, I don't want that in my neighborhood, you know. So y you need to kind of come up with a really exciting image and you have to go for it. And then the community will be like, oh, I feel respected by this, you know. Like, I would like that piece of beautiful architecture in front of my apartment building and then they then you're you know they feel like they're going to get something and then the community might might get more on board with it i think the problem that happens a lot in the united states is you know people say well what about if we put a, a busway on our street people don't really know what that is and then they say, well wait a minute i'm going to lose my left hand turn and then well, wait but i want to park my car in front of my church and you know pretty soon you've got something that that really doesn't add up to much so I, th I think it's really important to create that exciting vision, and then I think it's really important to sell that vision to the community and get them excited about it and show them why this might be great. And showing them other cities that have done a great job, like Cleveland and Johannesburg, is really pretty important. Most people who went down to Mexico City or been to Johannesburg or have seen Cleveland, they feel really transformed by it. They're like, wow, this really changed this corridor. I was really impressed by that Euclid Avenue corridor in Cleveland. This is a really deteriorated part of the city, and it's like new buildings popping up all over the place. So, uh, you know, it takes a lot of political courage. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, if you've got narrow streets, it takes even more political courage. But it's definitely possible. There's BRTs running through much narrower streets than you have in Boston. There are actually seven new hotels going up on Euclid Avenue right as we speak. So. But I think, you know, I think a wave is coming. At least I feel a wave. I think the millennials are, are, are a different generation. They're not the car-oriented generation. I think today they're voters. I think in a few years they're going to be the elected officials. So I think I think there's some real hope. You know, they're, they're not rushing out to get their driver's licenses. I think 22% don't have licenses. I use the term they'd rather spend $7 on a martini than $4 on a gallon of gasoline. It's probably good for our economy. But I think a change is coming. It's got to start at the grassroots. They've got to say, we, 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 we'd we love to give up our lane. I don't own a car anyways, but I want a quicker way to get downtown. Um, uh, thanks again for all three of you for coming coming to town. Uh, as we listen to you tell us how easy it would be to change some of these things, um, we'll try to keep our cynicism in check and, and, and keep open minds. Uh, as one who rode the silver line to come here tonight, the one down Washington Street, uh, I hope it's okay if I ask two very nuts and bolts kind of questions to see if you can shed some light on it. Um, the first is when you ride the Silver Line, uh, it feels like you're riding a roller coaster. The difference is that if you really rode a roller coaster that was that bouncy at an amusement park, you would think it was unsafe and you would never ever ride it again. So one question I have is when BRT is on a public street owned by a different agency than the one that's operating the BRT, 
aside from putting concrete at the stops where the bus will actually stay for a longer period of time, how do you prevent the rest of the street from becoming literally a roller coaster and being a very, very uncomfortable ride for much of the route? And then the second question I have is, um, all of us who ride the Silver Line today would love to see off-board fare collection. It is the most frustrating thing to have the entire thing come to uh, a, a grinding halt when someone is trying to get their dollar bill to go through the thing uh, at the front of the bus. Um, when you do off-board fare collection, there has to be some inefficiency. There has to be some violations. Have you calculated what those violations are, i.e., people who cheat? And is the cost or the revenue that you lose from those violations outweighed by the money you save by having the system operate more efficiently? Thank you. Let me be the first to jump at that. Uh, travel time is, is key. Uh, again, uh, travel time is key to, to our success, um, not just in terms of increased ridership, but increased efficiency. Um, w when we operate the number six bus line on Euclid Avenue, stopping 108 times and collecting fares at every stop, I needed 28 bus operators and 28 buses to provide peak hour service. Now because we have all these efficiencies, the off-board fare collection, the exclusive lanes, the exclusive preemption, I'm providing better service with 16 labor units. So I'm saving a boatload of money. That's even apart from the fare collection process. Um, we, we keep statistics. Uh, we feel our fare violation rate is somewhere between 3 and 5%. Um, do I love it? No. Uh, do I know what it is when we collect fares on every bus? I, I think it's probably around 3%, so I think it's, a, it's about the same amount. I don't think it's that much worse, if it is worse at all. Um, many of our customers are taking something to the health line, another bus route to the health line, or a, a rail route to the health line. So they're paying there in a more precise fare collection process and using that all-day pass to transfer or validate on the line. So. Um, we spend much too much money in the industry collecting, counting fares anyway. Um, it's a tremendous amount. I mean, the, our ticket vending machines were 40, 000, I call them $40,000 refrigerators, and I have people maintaining them every day. But again, I think it's part of the system and more part of the rail-like feel than anything else, but not that concerned about that. In terms of the roadway, again, we rebuilt the roadway as part of our project, all new 12-inch concrete the entire length of, of the roadway. Uh, turned that over to the city to maintain. So, you know, maybe in 5, 10, 15 years, if they're main, not maintaining it properly, it, it, it may be an issue. But so far, that's not been a, been a problem. But the whole thing was done, done anew. Um, again, the vehicle is a key, the, the vehicle that, that rides more like a train than, than a bus. And there, aren't, there isn't a lot of vehicle manufacturers in the U.S. anymore that meet Buy America weight.